we've been talking a bit about evidence already, and, and that's somewhat of the thrust of what I want to talk about today. Uh, the evidence of evolution. Darwin had a lot of points to make and, and thoughts about how species came to be and uh, how species evolved, although he didn't use that word very often. And uh, he had a lot of good thoughts about it, uh, but he didn't have a lot of the evidence that's come up since then. So it's a pretty interesting thing to see the fact that uh, the evidence that's come up since that time in a scientific manner has supported evolution in so many ways. And, and uh, although he had some misconceptions and misunderstandings of how this could all work, uh, basic theory holds strong and true and like always, scientific knowledge advances and more things become clarified and we understand uh, clear, more clearly how the world works. So if we talk about evidence, it's a funny thing. You could imagine, and you've probably had some discussions where you thought you were pouring evidence into somebody's ear holes and, uh, and it didn't seem like it was really working too well. But I wanted to get away from maybe some of the obvious things about it and talk about maybe you, imagine you had a friend. I was just riding my bike along the Natchez Trace back in October and through Mississippi and so on. But um, you start thinking about the old uh, um, large portion of land that was purchased, and you, you start telling a friend about it. America bought a large portion of its current land mass from Napoleon Bonaparte in 1803. Never happened, they say. You do a little research. You say, 828,000 square miles. <coughs> Portions of 15 states and even two Canadian provinces that aren't shown up on there. This just cuts it off at the 48th parallel. Don't believe it, their reply. America really only sought to purchase a small amount of land right here around New Orleans and the coastal areas near that. That's what they approached Napoleon about. Napoleon was uh, buff was buffeted by war debt. He'd been in some pretty big campaigns just prior to this. Uh, and he started thinking he'd like to unload some of these things. He didn't know how to keep and spend the money to keep these things uh, proper, properly. So for 50 million francs, they offered the U.S. to buy all that land shown in pink there. Also, the, um, the uh, forgiveness of another debt to the U.S. about 18 million francs. So the total cost to the U.S. was about 15 million dollars in that time, or about 250 million dollars in today's money. Just, a, I think it comes out to like a penny and a half an acre or something like that. Or money. Okay. So you show copies of documents and maps. You show articles from history books magazines, etc. You can even show paintings that were made at the time. The transfer of the French flag and the American flag going up. Okay. But even then, probably that's not going to be fully convincing. Maybe you go and you take a trip with the person and you go and you have some French cuisine. <laughs> You see the preponderance of French language spoken down there, the names on lakes and roads and different things, um, buildings and so on. You can imagine that finally this amount of information and evidence should convince almost all people of the truths of your statement. Okay? And that's pretty much what science has done over the past 200 years, really 150 years or so since, uh, since Darwin came out with this. But it's the effort of, that we all support, and we, we like that, that emphasis. You look at a thing, you test it, you set up a hypothesis, you evaluate it, and you prove facts. Okay? So, our body carries information, too, that convincingly supports evolutionary facts. I want to go into a little bit of basic structures of the body and say some interesting things, and that's one emphasis of this, but then I want to get on to what those facts are telling us. But here's a few. First, we're going to review some of the amazing stuff science has learned about living bodies. Our bodies, as well as all living things, are made up of cells. 
there are 37.2 billion cells in an average person's body. 37.2 billion. Almost all types of cells have a nucleus. There's a few that don't. Anyone know some cells in our body that don't have a nucleus? Red blood cells. Red blood cells don't have them, right? They're using all that volume to carry oxygen around, okay? But almost all of them have a nucleus, and the nucleus is a very important structure in there, okay? In, in the nucleus is contained all the information needed to build another you. Human cells contain 23 pairs of chromosomes, and on those chromosomes reside the genes that carry all the coded information your cells use to manufacture all the structures in your body. Each So there's the cell and the nucleus from the cell, the chromosomes inside the cell in pairs, and on those chromosomes are the DNA strands, okay? Maybe a little bit of a review, of a review but also some um, emphasis on things that's been learned in the last while, and some of us haven't been in science classes for too long, for quite a while. Um, those spirally wound chromosomes from each cell in your body are about two meters long. If you take all those spirally wound parts and stretch it out, each cell in your body has structures, chromosomes that's over two meters long, six and a half feet, taller than Paul Selna. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. Okay? Each cell, okay? That's the potential for a lot of information, obviously. It's all helically coiled up and captured in there and so on. But it's an amazing fact to think about that each cell of your body has six and a half feet of captured information. And it's all, for the most part, identical, right? Each cell knows how to make a liver, knows how to make bones, knows how to make sex cells, knows how to make hair, knows all these different things. It applies it in different places in different cells. So that's a wealth of area to study for scientists. The information is kept on the famous double helix that you see on the right there, found by Rosie Franklin, James Watson, and Francis Crick. <coughs> the famous abbreviation, it's called DNA, the famous abbreviation of deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA consists essentially of long strands of coded instructions that specify the order of each cell's manufacture of, of uh, protein. Proteins are the molecules that do all the work in every organism, from carrying oxygen, to building tissue, to copying DNA to make the next generation of cells. Okay? So all that's in these. This is the human chromosome pairs 23. Does anyone know how many chromosome pairs there are in uh, other primates, the like apes and 24, 24 right? Okay, and it's even shown where that, where we've had ones combined to take the 24th chromosome and combine, so we have 23 pairs. So, pretty interesting stuff. None of this, none of this refutes anything Darwin looked at and solved and tried to understand, and most, almost all of it, every bit of it basically supports most of what he said. So, DNA then, is made up of two strands of four distinct bases. You can see them, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Okay? These chemical building blocks are represented by the single letters A, G, C, and T. The two strands are held together by strong chemical bonds between pairs of bases that lie on opposite strands. You can see the blue there. A always pairs with T, and G always pairs with C. Always, okay? So there's the sugar phosphate backbone, and this is all these coiled up strands of individual, they call those base pairs there. One of those makes a base pair. None of this Darwin had any idea of that, right? Typical DNA text. If you, as, as uh, cells do when they split, you get one side of, of uh, the DNA molecule goes in one cell and the other side can go in the other. 
may form um, a pattern. But you, this is a DNA text. This would be written on the potential, uh, if, you, if you translate what was on those code, that's what you would have for hundreds of pages, just those letters. And the whole aspect of the Human Genome Project is looking at and decoding what this really means. Okay? Computers, Joanne and I were talking about computers a little bit earlier, computers are essential to this work. It can look for patterns, see things, and, and coordinate. There's a lot of interesting things they've found, but basically what they, the other thing they found is that there's triplets of these base pairs. So this is, again, if you'd split one of these DNA up in half and you'd look at it, you'd see one side of this. So this, these three codes here are G, C, and T, and they code for an amino acid called alanine. Okay? The next three code for the next amino acid. All the way through here, each one, these three code for that. CTT will meet up with leucine again. And then there's even codes that are stop codes. If you have a T, A, and G in the proper progression in the DNA, that stops the whole sequence, right? It stops the pattern and it tells the, it tells the, that's the end of the gene and it tells to stop that and now you'll be starting something else. So it's the stop code to, to make all these proteins up. Okay. So proteins are made up of these building blocks that are called amino acids. So when you get to a stop code, that, can, that stops one certain protein and, and it may start another or it may have some junk DNA for a while in there too. So each amino acid is coded as a combination of three bases or it's also often called a triplet. ACA, GDT, all these different things that you see. 400, on average, amino acids assembled in a chain specify a protein. That can wide, wildly change, but it's a good idea to keep about 400 triplets, which would mean 1,200 base pairs, can specify one amino acid. I'm sorry, one protein. The length of DNA that codes for a protein, we've often called a gene, right? So I just kind of want to get some of these base things in here, you know, uh, base understandings of what it is. None of this, again, understood by Darwin at all, but it starts giving you the basic ideas of what people have been finding out about science, about the cell structure, about how things work from that. Okay? So just by math, there are 64 different triplet combinations. If you have A, C, T, A, C, A, A, C, G, all these different ones can make 64 different combinations. And that's just four can be on the first triplet, four can be on the second, four can be on the third, so four times four is 16, times four more is 64. So there's 64 total combinations, and they make these 20 different amino acids, which build up and make the proteins that give us all the information we use to, our bodies use to make and do all of our activities, okay? So only 20 amino acids, so that means there's multiples at times. There's also three of them that are stop codes, like I mentioned earlier. They stop the formation of the protein, okay? So, but then there can be things happen, and here's where mutations have been found to occur pretty regularly. We talked about leucine earlier as one example of an amino acid. One original triplet could be called, could be the TTA, three genes, that triplet makes leucine. But it could have a mutation, something could occur, and that A could be mutated and changed to a G one of the other base pairs. It still is leucine. It could also have the front letter change. The T could become a C. Still leucine, if it's CTA. Those triplets could multiply, those mutated triplets could also mutate 
And you could have two changes. C and T could be changed there. All of these are examples of different ways that the body can still make leucine. Okay. Mike, what's the common thread? The common thread with these? Well, if you just start, it happens to be T in this case. Leucine always has a T in the middle. And if you can see that actually, if you have a C in front, you could have any of the other four Uh, pieces in there that make it up, A, T, C, or G. So this code and, and in, in the uh, development of the body, this always codes, when those three are together, leucine is always made. Okay? But if you had a different, if, if this T would change to an A, it wouldn't be leucine anymore, right? You wouldn't be making that amino acid. So certain mutations will not change the end result. Okay? Those are called synonymous mutations. They don't change anything. Does the T always have to be in the middle? For leucine, it does right here. This is just one example. Leucine is the most, is the, is the amino acid with the most um, possible options here. Most of them have only two, some only have one. So if you have an amino acid that only has one possible code for it, let's say it's AGA, okay, any mutation to it will change it and you won't make that amino acid anymore. You'll make a different one or maybe a stop code. Okay? Is the order significant? Is TTA the same as ATT? No, it is not. This is very significant. The pattern there, it's a code. It's like reading a code. Okay? And that codes for leucine. ATT, and I'm not up on what, what each code stands for, but ATT codes for a completely different amino acid. It's the way it progresses on the DNA uh, chain, right? But that assumes that there's a start marker on the DNA chain. Otherwise, how would you know where to start? Yeah, I mean, it assumes a lot about what, what things need to be done and how a progression has to has to go. There is a path to that. There is an understanding of that. I don't, I don't know it completely and I think it's pretty deep as to how it knows. I know there's a stop code and there's other things they're still finding out about where does it start. When they go back, when they go to this, let me get back here a second. This thing could, could change in a lot of different ways. A might not be the starting point. This could be AGT which stands for one but really somehow the body knows that that's not the starting point. The starting point for this progression really is GTT. And then that changes everything, right? One change, a, a destruction of one molecule in here changes the whole code. And we'll see some of those examples later too. And that's hardly what mutations are, okay? Changes can have a significant effect. If we go to here, you can see that this thing starts with GCT, so that stands for this amino acid, okay? All these amino acids have the capacity to be produced because they're being told to be produced in there, and in that pattern, they make a protein that tells the body to do something, okay? Build a bone, carry oxygen, do all the different things that the body has to do. So all these mutations that can occur for a wide variety of reasons will still make leucine and it won't change the production of that protein because it didn't change this amino acid on the string. Okay. So the first thing that that means is that there's a lot of things about staying where you're at. If you can have mutations there's certain things about the human body and this whole structure of this that keeps us the way we are anyways, right? That stops changes from being disastrous and, and, and uh, killing us, right? So here's a little bit of the math. 64 possible triplets, A, C, G, T, 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 etc. means there's four in the first line, 
four in the second, four in the third, so by math, the possible permutations come out to be 64. But for any triplet, like this triplet here, there are three possible changes at each base. So the A could also become either C or G or T. The C could become one of the other three. The G could become one of the other three. So three plus three plus three is nine total changes that this thing can change at. So if you take 64 different possible triplets and each triplet can have nine total changes, 64 times nine is 576 different possible random mutations. So a mutation can occur for whatever reason and change one letter on the triplet code and then you have, you have a, a, a result of that. If you look at that, and if you just look back at all those lists, and like leucine has seven different possible options it can be and still be leucine. If you look, count up all the times that a genetic code can change and still be the same amino acid, there's 135 times that that happens, science, scientists have determined. So 135 out of 576 is 23% of the time a mutation can occur but not change the resulting amino acid. Okay? But that means that 77% are non-synonymous. They have an impact. It'll change leucine to something else, right? Or stop the protein or whatever. So mathematically, that's a ratio of 1 to 3. 23 to 77 is very close to 1 to 3, right? So we're saying 1 out of 3 time, or 1 to 3 ratio of synonymous changes, things that don't impact, that don't change what this animal, what this cell does, or plant, um, are going to occur 1 out of 3 times. But when you look in nature, you find out that actually you find a ratio that's synonymous, in other words, no change, no deleterious effect, to a non-synonymous change, which could be a deleterious effect, it's some effect, of 3 to 1. So we see it three times, 3 to 1 changing of a, a no change in, in effect, that uh, an animal or a creature or a plant would stay without that amino acid changing. 3 to 1, which is a 10 times more common end result of no change in change. Instead of 1 to 3, instead of most changes having a, an impact, most changes by a factor of 3 to 1 don't have an impact. Okay? So why would that be in the real world? Why is that mathematical number not holding? There's one reason that things happen but different than the math. Dan? Well, because if they happen, if they, if they happen in a deleterious way, those things will die because of natural selection. And so the tendency would be, if you're going to survive, to have things not change. Right. Most, most impacts, most mutations cause a deleterious effect. A deleterious effect can be a spontaneous abortion before an animal is even born, or a plant not germinating, or all these different things can occur. And so those don't even get put into the mix. They aren't, aren't even noticed. So, you're right. Natural selection. In, in fact, it's really a, an amazingly supportive structure that there is no other real solution for why. I mean, you can get down into the, into the nuts and bolts of it, but when you look at it, natural selection means that's pe that uh, creatures, plants, animals that have a deleterious impact, right? That'll die off. Natural selection is the survival of the fittest. Right. Question? Um, well, that ratio that you were just talking about, <coughs> is it only because of certain things survive that were basically the ratio on? Like maybe the ratio actually was the other ratio, but the ratio was coming off to like so that only ones that survive is what we're basically Right. By mathematics, I mean, there's, there would have to be some level of, let's say, spiritual influence to say, well, I'm not going to allow this one to mutate because it'll make a bad thing that'll die off. I'm only going to make my mutations occur on things that will be good or whatever, you know. So that's the natural, uh, the natural selection is the fact that it means that they over the mutate die. Right. Right. 
mutations tend to be deleterious. Mutations also can be very helpful. It's what's built us up slowly, you know, from the slime that, you know, our ancestors were. <laughs> Pardon me? If you go back to uh, the penicillin, so the question is for one to three, why it's three to one, then you may specify that the three to one is because you're talking about inheritance, not just the mutation. Because the mutation can happen to me, you don't have to pass on to uh, my... Right, it doesn't body. have to show up in your sex cell. So sex cell. still one to three, right? Uh -huh. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in, in some ways we tend to humanize it and think about it in terms of humans, but this is true for the peas that Gregor Mendel worked with. It's true for bacteria. It's true for a lot of different things. Rich? I'm not sure that I follow what you're saying because we've got a mutation <laughs> in the DNA. Is it in a single cell that it's happening, or is that one cell carrying that new mutation that's deleterious being passed on to the other cells that it generates when it splits and creates further cells? So, what are you saying there? Is that mutation happening in a single cell first and is then getting passed on to other cells? But if it's deleterious, would that cell be able to pass it on? We all start out as one cell. Agreed. Mm -hmm. so, so, I'm, I'm, I think I'm looking at it more in the case of that, that initial cell that then becomes a creature, right? If that cell is formulated with a mutation in it, right? But yes, I think that if, if one cell in your body or one cell in, in a corn plant or whatever has a mutation on it that it's not passing on, that cell dies off and it doesn't, doesn't want to result in, in changes here, right? I mean, it still has some impact, but it still dies off. My son, you have it the sperm or the egg cells, right? That's all. It doesn't matter what happens in your arm. Again, you're, you're just talking about humans, maybe, and in, in plants and, and uh, bacteria that don't reproduce sexually, then there's some impacts that, I don't, that make that not completely true. But yeah, I'd agree with that. Go ahead. Mutations also happen in the cell after the organism is completely developed. Yes. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what cancer is, essentially. I mean, we are all with mutations so regularly, and our cells are self-programmed. Tractosis, they commit suicide when they understand there's an issue. So not the, cells, the cells commit right. suicide, right? And they've had some impact on that, but then that's not saying that some other cell can do the exact same thing and, and, and become a cancer cell, too. And when you have a predilection towards cancer, that's a danger with that. Okay? I'm on the blank page here. So, I would say that in the context of our talk, and there's always other issues, but as you're, as you're looking at this fact that as a cell develops, if it has a mutation that tends to be deleterious, it knocks that cell's capacity, it knocks, it knocks uh, that out, and that cell doesn't, doesn't go on and pass on and become another, pass on its, its uh, information to another creature. Pedro? Yeah, before we continue with that, one small question. Uh, before you mentioned, uh, when you talk about mutations, and you mentioned that a nucleotide uh, letter changes its uh, turns from A to T or whatever. But there are also part mutations where, as you mentioned, the letter vanishes, and then the sequence changes, and then you have gene duplication that uh, uh, leads that's to a encoding of a different protein. Right. And how does that factor into the mathematics that you have uh, shown before? You, you, just, you were just talking about a certain kind of mutation, but you didn't, didn't include this kind of unmutation that 
it's a new sequencing. In my math, I it, it wasn't, right? It's a simplistic view, I guess, of what's happening in the structure. But yeah, there are other things. Um, and, and I would, I don't have facts to back this up. I'm like, Aaron Kane. The 3 to 1 number that you observe in nature, this is the number you recorded. This is including all kinds of mutation, not just the the ones that you mentioned at the beginning, right? I didn't hear the exact no, question. The, the three to one number that is observed in nature, as opposed to the one to three, mm -hmm. that includes all kind of rotation, not just the rotation, uh, rotations that change the letter. That's a question. Yes, yes. And I would say that there are, and I'll, I'll be talking about some of those uh, distractions or taking away from the from the cell structure as we go on a little bit more. I kind of want to get this as the base, as a support of how this concept and going down into the amino acids and the protein development and the genetic structure supports Darwin's evolutionary scheme of the theory uh, of evolution. So, two things I want to talk about, and one is immortal genes. And what does it mean to be an immortal gene? There's a, a, a structure in, in the uh, cell structure in the, in the nucleus for, it's called the elongation factor, and it has a basic function of decoding genes that, that we're talking about today. And if you look on the chromosomes, if you look in the, in the genetic structure of different animals, you see some interesting results. So a code for this And these are codes for amino acids. So each of these stand for a different triplet. Okay? And in humans, there's a string of 26 letters here, 26 amino acids that pass along uh, information about how to decode the genes and how the, then the genetic structure is supposed to work, what the proteins are supposed to do. All right? Here's the tomato, the same area in a tomato. 26 genes, if you see, the last one is a different amino acid there. That's why you like pizza so much. Yeast. My notes on this, I think, say... Um, I think there's another one. Fourth from the end. Okay? That's why you like wine so much. Archaea are some of the uh, original, original living structures in the, in the earth. Two V's at the end instead of two I's. I think there's about five changes on this. Bacteria has another six more, but many still the same. D, P. In fact, I took the time to put the ones. These are the immortal genes. We have these same amino acids in the same position throughout three million, three billion years of existence. Three billion years. Okay. Because each of these has to be able to decode genes. And in fact, part of this is why you can get insulin, if you're diabetic, you get insulin and it doesn't have to come from a human, they make it from bacteria. They can train the bacteria to make insulin and you can now have a much more readily, ready, ready supply of insulin because of this commonality across all the species. Okay? That's GMO, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> you got an agenda, man. <laughs> okay. So, would you say that these codes are the same or different between species? The, the, the ways of making all these things coming along? Uh, would codes be closer in similar species, like apes and baboons, than they are in different 
different species like fish and birds. I mean, what, what we're basically finding out is that science is seeing the similarity in life, right? The similarity, the basic similarity, all the way to original life three billion years ago. Okay? Changes that are, are, are similarities that are here in bacteria and archaea and are in humans now and in all these things that have gone through three billion years of evolution, these similarities prove a common ancestor. Right? We came from a common ancestor, and then through mutations and changes and things that went on, each of us have progressed down the path that we're we on. Okay? It's very similar. Good thing there's differences, but very similar. Another item of importance to know is that a large portion of DNA is non coding. They don't agree to that yet. Um, it doesn't direct the cell to make a protein. Oftentimes, you've probably heard it's been called junk DNA. But scientists have been finding that at least portions of it have been important, have important functions beyond coding for protein manufacture. Some are triggers, and you can have a trigger in one place on a gene that triggers, or on a chromosome that triggers action in a whole other place on that same chromosome. And there, that's where a lot of the biological science is trying to figure out how is it happening, how are they doing this, how does this all happen? What makes the same information in one cell make it become a bone, while that same information is triggered and used differently, right, to make another cell, make a nerve cell, or anything else? Okay. And there's fascinating work going on with that. Okay. So, the code carried in DNA is always subject to mutations. Build, and I want to look at some interesting um, discoveries that go on with some of that. This is a fellow who might not be able to get back in the country if he left, Abdel Salam. In LSU in 2003, he came up with this, and I have to kind of work you through this. this these are photographs of uh, ways that uh, a detection instrument was able to detect for longer lengths of information inside the uh, cell structure of different species. So if you look along the top, on the far, on this side, the left side, it's just a marker that just shows that things are working. So it's just like something that tends to show that the experiment is running properly. But then they take genetic material from humans, bonobos, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, I'm sorry you can't read this too well, siamings, which are the largest gibbon in the world, green monkey, and owl monkey. So some of these are, are primates, some of them are great apes, some of them are, uh, are monkeys, lesser apes and monkeys. And so they take some structures and they look in, in this area down at the bottom. Here, this is the code for where they're looking on the genetic structure. And they find evidence of, by the virtue of this lighted bar here, of a code that's maybe 400 triplets long. And it's there for everything except green monkeys and owl monkeys. Okay? So that tends to give you the impression that these are more in a family than these, right? It comes up more here, and you get some other results up here. Okay? This one knocked out the CMA, I believe. Up here, you start to get to another area in the code structure, and all you have that show this are human, bonobo, chimpanzees, and gorillas. Okay? The orangutan doesn't show this structure anymore. Further up, in another area of the testing area, humans, bonobos, and chimpanzees have. Gorillas have lost, have not developed this short interspersed element, is what they call it. And you can even find some that are there and only for humans. Okay? So that gives you some kind of understanding that maybe um, goes along with what our basic understanding is of the evolution of, of the apes, right? 
but it can be very precise and it can tell things that, um, that maybe we're just assuming just based on physical appearances or looking alike. Okay. That's a CMing, by the way. I had a little video, but I'm running way low on time. So these things uh, swing through the trees and they have this expanding pouch that they vocalize in. They're the kind you don't want outside your. Uh, who, you, who's going to uh, uh, Mary Mossman? And you guys are going to uh, Thailand? Or Burma. Burma. Okay. Yeah. Ah, they're pretty endangered. I don't think you'll see them unless you go to the zoo. <laughs> so this is what you can do based upon that other study. And now this is not anything that's really uh, out of our level of understanding. My understanding was how to draw this and get everything to line up. It's beyond my level of understanding. But, um, but you know, we don't know that much, and some people might think an owl monkey is more similar to us than a green monkey is, or whatever. But but this. Those studies that uh, were done in LSU and other places tend to prove this evolutionary line. So this is showing a common ancestor and then the owl monkey worked at that. From that common ancestor, that came to something else which became a common ancestor for all of these, right? And working its way up, and each one of these broke away from that line that we think is the most important line. And CMAs might have a whole different impression. <laughs> they vocalize much better than most of us do. So this keeps on, this shows that there's differences that are more between an orangutan and a human than a gorilla and a human. And over here, the last common ancestor that went on to become a human, and then it broke off here, and then chimpanzees and bonobos are, are in that area too. So those are the immortal genes that you can see that translate over all time, right? That's the one concept. Fossil genes are something that Pedro was talking about a little bit back there. Non-functional remnants. Here's, this is exactly what you were asking about, I think, Pedro. Certain areas, missing bases, they can throw off the three base at a time decoding of the gene's text. So this is the a coding of an area on a dolphin that is related to blue color vision, the short wavelength opsin gene. Okay? Dolphins lost somewhere this, this base. And over here they lost this and three more. That's going to change the protein manufacture that's done there, right? And cows, look how similar it is. And nothing's changed, actually. It's just that instead of uh, mutating into a different base, it actually changed, it actually was lost. So it shifts the reading frame, which is what we were saying earlier, and Pedro said too. So now it would read TTT, TTC, and make a whole other protein, and go on here and then get lost in the translation, and it makes no sense. Maybe hit a stop or something. It just, it just doesn't do anything that's of value. Right? So, missing bases throw off the three base at a time decoding of the gene's text, shifts the reading frame, and makes the gene non-functional. All dolphins and whales have a fossil opsin gene, and they don't see, on that short wave spectrum, they don't see blue light. Okay? It's, here's another example. The myosin muscle gene. Macaques, gorillas, chimps, this is all exactly the same here. Two of these structures right here were lost. This whole thing doesn't perform. In humans, the deletion of two bases disrupts the code of the gene and is associated with the reduction of two muscles involved in chewing, which are massive in our ape relatives. This is why we have to use science if we want to be a nutcracker. <laughs> if only we had this power, right? So that's that's the genetic DNA structure that caused that to happen. Okay. Another example. Nocturnality in mammals. 
Why are certain animals nocturnal? It, they fit into a certain niche, right? They get their food better that way, they're safer from predators, different things. They found an area to be in, right, that works for them, okay? Out of all the higher primates, the owl monkey, which we visited earlier, it's the only nocturnal animal among higher primates. Its shortwave system, or uh, opsin gene, is also non-functional. Do you think it has the same mutations as the dolphins? Would you say, who says yes? Who says no? And why would it be no? Who can give an idea why it would not have the same mutation? There's so many ways for mutations to occur statistically. Yeah. Right. If you would happen to see mutations at the same place, that would give you a certain indication that it probably happened with a common ancestor, right? But if owl monkeys are the only higher primates that lost this skill, lost this short, this blue spectrum, they lost it way after they separated from dolphins, right? Or dolphins separated from us. Good. Nocturnal prosimians. Now these are less than the higher primates. Lemurs, lemurs, tarsiers, bush babies, lorises. I've got some pictures here. Okay. Owl monkey here. <laughs> so much of life is. Bush babies. Okay. The slow loris. And the blind mole rat. Do you see its face here? Here's its mouth, its nose, skin and fur over its eye areas. Okay. All right, let's go back to the... So the nocturnal prosimians, the three, not including the uh, blind mole rat, uh, their opsin gene has a big chunk of code missing. The same opsin gene that's up here. Would you hypothesize that it is similar among these prosimians? Do you think that the bush baby and the owl monkey and the slow loris all have similar mutations on their, on their uh, genetic structure? Because yeah. it happened at about that time, right? And the naked mole rat, something else is going on there. Right? <laughs> okay. In fact, it has opsin genes that still work. Its eyes, even though they're covered with skin and fur, can still detect small amounts of light. And they think that the only basic value of it is maybe to keep its biological clock kind of timed. It can sense light and dark and so on, and it keeps its biological clock there. And it has to be for some reason, because if it was for no reason at all, it would have died off long ago. Those genes would have become non-functional, like they did in the dolphin or the or other animals. Like that. It's a use it or lose it kind of thing. Okay. So are you saying it's never the case that, um, that behaviors persist even though they're not adaptive? Behaviors. Um, well. I think that Darwin's theory basically says that uh, if things are not are not uh, helpful in terms of um, uh, survival, they die off. They tend to die off. But are you saying they always do? There's cases where that's not. Well, I'll give it enough time. Natural selection doesn't select for a useless trait. So if the trait is useless, it may be propagated in a genome, but eventually something is deleted, something is changed, but it was a useless trait to begin with, so that trait disappears as well. I mean, it would tend to, I would, I would agree that it would, I mean, the, the emphasis would be that non-useful traits would die off. And is there a time, what would, what would cause them to go? We can see in so many ways where things that aren't actually adding value, if they add no survival value, Mathematically, things would tend to uh, a mutation wouldn't that, that got rid of it wouldn't tend to survive. 
there's things that tie together that maybe make it work more and we may not understand it you know you have to look at the naked mole rat and decide what is it and we're maybe making something up why is it surviving in the naked mole rat we're going by the theory that it has to be useful in some way so then they say maybe it's a biological clock right so you know there but basically i'd agree that evolutionary theory says that it will die off whether that's not true or not the human appendix that well, it's it's it was useful to people or to to uh, species not that long ago, but evolutionarily, it's not a useful function. It's not like you know the next week it, it leaves or something like that. This stuff takes a long time. Paul, the, the, the thing that's missing in this discussion, I think, is the idea that there's a metabolic cost to generate an animal. So every every function that we have. There's some cost, you know, the, the peacock with its large tail. That's very costly. Mm -hmm. But it and hence has some survival mechanism because it attracts more females. And so that species accepts that large tail, even though it's very costly, because it has this other benefit. Right. And so in the case of this naked mole rat, presumably there's some cost to develop this eyeball. And if you had a, competi a particular competition, between naked mole rats with the eyeball and naked mole rats without the eyeball, somehow, in ways that we can only speculate, there may have been some reason why the naked mole rats with the eyeball probably reproduce the naked mole rats without the eyeball, and so it stays to this day. Or could we just have it given enough time, and maybe in another you know, 20,000 years, naked mole rats won't have we don't know exactly where we are on this time. Right, right. Neil. Where is genetic drift? Genetic drift. Well, it's as things change, generally in smaller populations, as I understand it, if you have a small population of deer, let's say, that's been kept in a certain protected area, then they, uh, they by mutations and by the strongest one having certain odd characteristics about it, passes its genetic structures on to other people, but other, other people, other deer. <laughs> and, uh, and so then because of that genetic, th that may change and, and move on and be different than another species. See, I had a different understanding of what else was wrong, which is mutation would be left behind. It would be the death of the community, leaving the pity that individual behind to die. They now persist because we, as humans or animals, we raise for other reasons. And, and these things that used to kill us are, are don't kill us anymore. We have other medicines and so on that keep us going. So they stay in the genes. They're no good. But they no longer kill us, is what I thought was part of just this, this crazy notion of drift. I think there's a lot different about drift is not only there drift occurred long before humans started influencing uh, other animals populations so i don't think i'd agree with that yeah, my, according to the dictionary you're correct the variation in the relative frequency of different genetic types in a small population going to the chance of disappearance of particular genes as individuals die or yeah Paul, fast one yeah you can talk about the kinds of random yeah, I'm running out of time. <laughs> but in more form, in more formal terms, fossil genes are exactly what we would predict to evolve as a consequence of the continuing action of mutation over time in the absence of natural selection. So there's no natural selection that tells these dolphins that you're doing worse now because you don't have this blue capacity to see blue light. They see just as well as others, right? So they go on. We're having a, we're having a, uh, as humans, I think that it's shown that about 8% of males have color blindness. And if you look in the species in the wild that have, the primates that have color vision, only they, I think they did a search of like a thousand different uh, monkeys and found three of them. You know, so it's a very small number that have lost their color vision. And that's probably a mutation 
that will die out, or, or the thing that will die out. Okay. All the way around, acquired. It's an acquisition. Red is, is an acquired color over the past 10, 20,000 years. Exactly. Uh, in many cases, in, in monkey species, it's only the females that can see red. None of the males can. I hadn't heard that. So the females can find right fruit, and that way they feed people, and that way they keep they keep the guys around. That's, That's why they don't let male monkeys drive cars. They don't. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> they the female monkeys are specified much they better drivers. You send them to the store. <laughs> Yeah, I, I took out a whole section of talk about uh, color vision uh, in, in, in primates that New World monkeys have no color vision, but Old World monkeys, which we're a part of, have color vision. And why is that? You know, there's a whole big interesting talk about that. That's, that's something worth looking into. Fossil genes, which we've been talking about, these things that die off in mole rats and in and in uh, all these different, the dolphins and so on, and in us, in our jaw structure, they're the marks of changes in lifestyle from those of ancestors. So when your lifestyle changes, then things fall off that aren't necessary. And when we can spot and track fossil genes, like Paul was saying, these are valuable clues to reconstructing natural history. One more thing thing here. 25,000 mammalian genes. By far the largest family of genes are, any idea? What's the most common mammalian gene? Levi. Yeah. Levi genes. <laughs> Bad joke. <laughs> Olfactory receptor genes. Why is it that mammals need, needed such capacity to smell? To survive. Sex, too. Dinosaurs. dinosaurs were tromping around. Mammalian creatures developed during a time when dinosaurs ruled the earth. They were very much nocturnal creatures. Okay, They got around by being stealthy and sly. Right? Those were our ancestors. They got away from the others. They, they used it for sexual pheromones and so on to, to uh, meet up with others. And also just to identify their food, what was good and what was bad. Mice have 1,400 olfactory receptor genes. Remember, that's out of 25,000. Okay. Human olfactory genes, not so much. Oops, jumped. 50% of our olfactory receptor genes are fossilized and non-functional in humans. We don't have as much fun taking a walk in the park as our dogs do. <laughs> so when and why did this happen? We talked about that a little bit. Clues. Mice, lemurs, New World monkeys, 18% of their olfactory genes are fossilized. Old world monkeys and the colobus, which is a new world monkey, 29% fossilized. So they were losing olfactory receptors. Non-human apes, orangutans, chimps, gorilla, 33% fossilized. And we're at 50% fossilized. The bottom two have the category, have the capacity of color vision. So as we gain color vision and could use that to pick ripe fruits, to find a mate, to go hunting, to do all these different things, we lost our need to rely on the olfactory receptor genes to do our to do what we needed to do. It wasn't as important a function. Okay, and so we've lost those. They haven't been important, so they've died out. And that's probably a good thing. <laughs> All right, here's my summary. Provide con uh, immortal and fossil genes provide conclusive evidentiary support for Darwin's theory of evolution by randomness and natural selection. Even though Darwin had no idea of genetics or the structure and mechanics of chromosomes, genes, DNA, amino acids, proteins, and cell growth, all of this, just 
meshes in with his basic concepts. It supports that all living things are descended from one common ancestor. And I hope I showed how that fits in. It helps us to clarify the evolutionary paths of all living things and specify how evolution progressed. It gives more evidence for exactly who progressed from what, who evolved from what. And it also helps you to clarify why and how unhelpful traits are lost. Okay? So, thanks for coming. I think I tried to cover it well. This is the book, The Making of the Fittest. If you have an opportunity, you can get it at the library or Amazon. Excellent book, Sean Carroll, that uh, talks about this and quite a bit more, too. So, thank you very much. Any questions or discussion is fine. Yes. Just, um, just to sort of bring it all back down to earth. So I've had a conversation with non-believers in evolution. Uh -huh. And when, when you describe the cellular mechanisms and all of that, to them that's so fantastically intricate that you simply can't persuade them when they see it at, even at that schematic level. I can't believe that something so complicated could evolve. And I understand that over time this can happen, but is there any model of something like that that works as an analogy to get people to feel more at their minds around that? I think that they like to get into their models that support theirs, and it's important to try to get away from their models, for one. Okay. Now, they want to talk about the eye, the beauty of the eye, and how the eye is so complex. I grew up with intelligent design. Yeah. And, uh, I wrestled with all of that, learned my way out of that. Right, right. right. But if you just talk about the, the, the similarities in the genome structure between Archaea three billion years ago and us, you know, I think that's pretty valuable to talk about, that they have these okay. things that are there that then could, over three billion years of time, you know, go on from that. I've always tried to, the time is the important thing. Darwin himself said none of this works without time. Right. And he was living in the time of Lord Kelvin, who had this whole knowledge of, based on the cooling of the earth, that the earth could only be, yeah. how old, Scott? Something like right. three or four billion years. Yeah, only three or four billion. Back then, back then, it was a couple hundred million. Right, okay. And so, you know, and Darwin agreed that his whole theory fails except by right. time. So time is the thing. I've always talked about this, if you, the length of life on Earth from one hand span to another, mm -hmm. and if you look at that and say, over the time that that is, from here to here, four billion years, well, this is when life first started, three billion years ago, mm -hmm. right? right? There was nothing but bacteria all the way till about here, right? So, so a, such a long time for those uh, initial fundamental mechanisms to evolve, like DNA, right? When you tell them about DNA, it's sort of like, yeah, but where did DNA come from? How could, you know what I mean? I, the argument is specious, but I, I struggle to present a model to somebody that helps them, you know, work with that length of time that confounds our intuition. I think time is a critical one, and, and you know, if you go with that, and, and I've practiced it a bit, you know, around here is when the first uh, the, the Cambrian explosion occurred and the mm -hmm. first kind of predators and things like that. Before that, there was nothing but slime mats and things right, like that, right? So all that time of life on Earth, from there to here, you know, dinosaurs are somewhere around from this point to this point. Sure. If you take history of hominids, you can take that off with a fingernail clipper. Yeah. And all recorded history, one scuff on a buffing you know, pad takes that off. So that's valuable. But there's a computer program out there, I believe it's called Evolution, where you can start with any set of combinations you wish and let the computer work and you can just sit there and watch it. You can set up your own world, you can set up anything you want and watch it evolve. And again, it's a matter of time. Dawkins did a lot on that too. Right. Yeah, Dawkins did a lot on time and, and an evolution and a computer. No, I was just going to say, when my kids were little, they had this game called Zimmer. And I played it one day. I thought that's a thing. I never played that. I'm going to go. I'm going to go.